Yes, May the 4th be with you, everybody. Today is May the 4th. You guys know that I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and hey, I had to have one of my fellow Star Wars uh, board game players with me today, and what better than Julio Trasado? Julio uh, is the owner of Ages. Uh, he has 3D printing, printing, UV printing, I mean, a bunch of other stuff that we want to talk to, to you about today. And I, you know, I witnessed since the day he bought his very first machine to now that he, he has all these different sort of equipment and uh, and we want to bring that to you. I know that there are a lot of 3D printers, you know, in the house. I know there are a lot of 3D people that would like to get into 3D printers to sell on Etsy, to sell on the Shopify store, to sell even on Amazon. So we're going to talk a lot about the pros, the cons, the difficulty, what you do, how do you do, how do you handle, you know, intellectual properties and all that beautiful stuff that we do with print on demand today. Julio, who are you? So my name is Julio Trezado, and I am the master fabricator of the Aegis Creative Company. Uh, what we stride in is making print-on-demand custom product for uh, basically anything. We range from 3D printing, laser cutting, UV printing, cards, dice. Basically, anything that can be printed, we can do it. We believe that we have the ability to create anything. And most importantly, as I tell everyone, always be creative and build something for yourself or for someone that you love. Definitely. I mean, it, and there is nothing more niche than this, right? I always tell my audience, when you build something that you have a niche of passion, that you focus on the things that you like, it is a lot of, be easier to build a company because your passion is involved, right? It's a lot easier also to build a following and also a lot easier to get into the customer's hearts when they see that you are real about what you're making. You are a war gamer at heart. I mean, I have, I have been in your house. I have seen your, your collection. We have Play to late hours at night, you know, at restaurants, looking like literally like total nerds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and but it shows, right? When you create your products, you you're passionate about it because you 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 it's something that you when you build one of your products, it's something that you yourself will play with if you have the chance. So and that is something that your customers, the people that are related to you, tend to to feel that connection. Uh, and it's important, right? And and I always. Focus on eight. Build something that you're passionate about, and what better than this? Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do. How how do you started doing this? Why do you decide to go into business? I mean, you're an engineer by profession. You have very good salary. I mean, it's like you didn't really, really need to go into business by yourself, but now it's like growing and out of control. And before I actually answer this mess, answer that for you, the most important thing, actually, really funny, hanging out with Fernando, the best part is that I get free lessons. <laughs> and one of the key things that, uh, that he has taught me was you try to make your stuff unique. And actually, based on what he said, I really took that to heart. And a part of this actually started with Fernando um, because what had happened was, the, the company started with six with with the seven, right? I was gonna pull out a thousand eight hundred dollars to get my first UV printer. And I had like I already had like some 3D printers on the side, but I was kind of more interested in trying to get like the Star Wars Destiny printing cards and the UV. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Fernando was there, he started it. And then the best part is we I got it. And then he said the magic words. He's like, he said right now, keeping something like creating something is cool, but putting it unique, like putting someone's name on it. That's what you specifically said that day. And I, didn't remember that, but okay. <laughs> I, I, I did. I remembered that. I'm like, that's actually pretty good. And that's where the creative part of the ages, because originally ages was just ages but then when i built the company i added creative company because i had that conversation with you thinking that not just that you could carry the words to create something so essentially we started with a uv printer her name is bertha very proud of the work she is the she's the one who made the business we were and 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 not just that i have to i gotta explain about the processes soon and we'll explain about that but that turned you know bertha turned into um you know her revenue turned into uh, a bigger printer, which is our Oki Data, our Oki Data C931, which prints out cards now that that is literally nonstop, like 24/7. And then we were starting off with a Cura Cut, <laughs> and the Cura Cut just couldn't handle it, so we had to go and order a cutter, a Vi cutter from China, 
which then I learned how to do shipping, importing, and all that other stuff uh, in reference to the business. And then that demand was so high that I had to get a second one that I'm about to pick up on, on May 17th, another cutter. And then at the same time, I have uh, I have to keep track of also uh, nine printers. I have nine 3D printers. I have proud to have two Wanhao i3s. I have three Ender 3s that have been modified by myself. I also have a big old Trunksy. Her name is Trixie. She's a big old 3D printer. And then I have a, I have a resin printer that is used to print my models. Every time I hear you talk about your machines, the first thing that comes to my mind is going in 60 seconds. Uh, the movie with Nicolas Cage and uh, what's her name? And, and Gina Jolie, that they name every single car something. And it's like, you refer to your machines, any friends. Why is that? Um, <laughs> it goes down to a couple. Well, here's the thing. Uh, a long time ago, I named all my cars. I know, I know all of my cars. My cars' name. They've been given names. It was tradition, and they've been named after women because in in board games and boats, they are every time you refer to the rules, you refer to as a her, as a she. And so we carried that. But then also I learned about crossfitting. Believe it or not, I did crossfitting at one time. And there was a set of exercises that were called the female dogs. And they were named after women that kind of followed that mantra. And the, and the exercises were so tough. So what I decided to do was name my machines like those really old woman names. Right. And so, uh, you know, Vivian, I have Veronica, I have um, I have Dottie as one of my printers. And the thing is, is that they get names when they've achieved special achievements. Um, some of them get it outright. So, for example, my biggest my biggest thing that I have in ages uh, is right now Octavia normally gets named Bertha. But since Bertha was already taken, I had Octavia. But the heaviest thing we actually have is Hank the Tank, which is our van. <laughs> which we just acquired from a trip from Florida too. <laughs> it reminds me, like not the real Star Wars, you know, like you know, everybody knows the Millennium Falcon, right? That is the main ship, uh, you know, from from Star Wars, right? But when we were in high school, you know, we used to go out, you know, in my friend's car, which was a very beat up uh, Dodge Dart, nineteen eighty something. It was a piece of junk, so we called it the Centennial Dove. <laughs> you know, like used to make like no millennial centennial and instead of Falcon Dove, you know, it's like it's like water, water, way, water, water, water <laughs> version of what we will do, you know, and, and and it was so much fun because we were like, hey, let's go to Centennial Dove and this is and it was like it, it was fun at the time, right? Naming 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 something and and attach and give it attachment. And even today I still talk to my friends 30 plus years later, you know, and we still laugh about you know that specific vehicle. Uh, so everything started with an idea, right? I mean, I, I remember the very first time I, 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 you know, it was very few months after they met you and, and it was, we were doing the charitable, charitable forces and you had a very rudimentary guy, uh, that was literally was used 3d printed. And, but this time around you with the charitable forces, which we never really got to play with them because, you know, we was, uh, COVID. COVID was impossible kind of like to play with it. But in this time, you know, when people ask what, you know, I mean, you, you went and did literally dyes that we're printing all the way around and, uh, and you had the machine and the system to do such a thing, which was pretty amazing. At the time it was like, really, you were the, one of the first ones that actually came out with that idea and you implemented it and and it worked uh this is all for charitable which i don't i don't remember this is the kids club or extra uh, life extra life uh, so and it, it helps you know i mean your business is also into charity and it's an amazing i mean how many people like to do that and you actually started this in the in because you it was one of the first thing you actually were doing which was charity uh how, how difficult is to get into 3D printer? I mean, I keep hearing other people want to buy. They want to go on Amazon. They buy these little ones for $200, and they want to start businesses with them. And they quickly realize that, you know, they can produce pretty much, you know, nothing with them. Uh, what is what is the barrier to entry? You want to start because 3D printing is here to stay. 
uh, you go to Etsy and it's it's just loaded. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you go to people buying in our niche, the board game niche. Uh, I mean, it's I mean our friend Trey. You know, he he's he 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 showed me a he gave me a box. You know, to put all my dice and stuff like that. And it was made on 3D printing. You know, you you make all sorts of different characters that we're gonna just look at them a little bit later. You know, but uh, it's just. It's just getting in very, very. It's evolving into giving the customer a better experience when it comes to the game boards now, because now you customize them to your taste and you make the displays and you make, you know, and you are looking into all the dioramas and stuff like that. It usually gets crazy expanded. You know, uh, how difficult it is to start doing something like this. The most difficult thing is the realization of what you're getting into. And the most important thing when you start off with 3D printing, and I cannot express it the most, is going to be patience. One of the things, and the barrier to entry when it comes to a cost, the first thing I'm going to tell you guys, if you want to kind of start off at the beginning, go ahead and go out to Ender 3. Go out and get a Creality Ender 3, Ender 3 Pro, Ender 3 V2, Ender 3, Ender 3 V2 Pro. These, I would recommend you getting them. And... It depends on your skill level. Like, for example, I started off with one, my, my wand house. And my wand house were, um, were actually used from Micro Center. People would return them back, and I'd get them for a bargain dollar. Something that would cost 350 bucks, I would bring them down to 150 The first one I got didn't actually have a problem. They just returned it. The second one had a bent gantry. I was able to bring Micro Center down to 125 on a three on a $350 printer back in six years mm, five years ago and so uh what i did is i learned my trials and pains through there and that's the most important thing when you first get this printer it's either built or you built it yourself right and when you build it yourself which me as an engineer i like using my hands when you build it yourself you get to understand the bits and pieces of mach of the machine and with the ender 3 you have the ability to put it together and modify it there's a lot of really cool modifications then after that, once you have the whole thing put together, you have to deal with the hardest aspect of 3D printing. Some people take a shortcut at it. Some people do it the good old fashioned way. Leveling the bed is the single biggest pain and keeping it leveled throughout the whole time. Having a rigid system will make your life easy. And with the Ender 3, that is where a lot of people struggle. And that's where people give up. You're going to have stuff that's going to come off the bed plate. You're going to have stuff that's going to go there. Perseverance, continue on going forward, fix the stuff, make sure everything works. That's right. We got an Ender Pro here. <laughs> Ender 3 Pro. Woohoo. Um, and that's the thing. And the Ender 3s, I actually want to expand and become a more of an Ender 3 house. And I want to get more of them. The Even the base one, it cost me only $179. Took me about three hours to put it together. And for me, it's therapy. I follow <laughs> instructions. And, and actually, it's kind of interesting because me as an engineer, I have to give instructions on what to do to people and save people from the stuff that they're doing and keeping them fixed up, right? Sometimes for me, working with my printers, I have to just, they give me instructions, and I put it together. I don't have to think. I just need to follow and do the thing that I have to do. So in reference to continuing on, patience is the biggest key. You will fail, but it's keep on getting up. Do keep on going. Eventually, you will produce perfect pieces. And also research, 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 research. I would recommend if you're going into 3D printing, get those enders. Don't buy a $1,000, $3,000, $4,000 like the Dremel. That's way over your head. Also, you want to watch out with printers that have chips in the filaments because the filaments will be – they have they, – they DRM filaments, which is crazy. So then that means you could buy, like, filament for, like, 40 bucks when you can go and get them. Like, for example, my store, I sell them for 17 bucks plus shipping. You can go to Amazon, and you can go and get them for $22, ne literally second-day air. Um, to your stuff and that's what those are the two things I would recommend when you're getting uh, into 3d printing start off with one because just like Pringles you can't have just one it turns, <laughs> into, two, turns into four turns into six yeah, turns nine sixteen <laughs> some of those 3d printing projects take forever <laughs> to print <laughs> and they can oh really, yeah 
they can really take your hair off. I mean, you were not as bold when I met you because I, mean, <laughs> I was absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and that's actually true. That's the other thing when it comes to patients. Some jobs are going to take, um, for example, that box that Trey gave you is going to probably be between 20, probably 15 to 16 to 20 hours. And then you know what the worst part is? In the middle of all of that, there's a chance it's going to fail. And that's the other thing. Failure is not an option when you get a 3D printer. You've got to continue. And eventually, you're going to make that breakthrough, and you're going to be wiser. It took me a year and two one how printers. Once I got my Ender 3, I got that bad boy running. I already had it queued up. I already knew what I had to do and get it up and running. I was already doing perfect prints, but that was a year of experience and of trial and error to get that running. Now, when you talk about filament, you said $17, $22, and a bunch of different numbers. What are we talking about? We're talking about a row, a box, or like a small, a small little thing. It's like, how long does that 17 last and how much can you print with it? <laughs> uh, uh, I guess I'll, I'll guess I'll break. I don't know if I want to break the secret, but um, no, no, it, I mean, you just say what you um, can say. It, it'll, 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 it, it lasts. Honestly, to tell you the truth, it lasts forever. Uh, the best part about 3D printing is that it's not about the material. It's about the amount of time it takes. So when we do our jobs, it's based on the amount of hours. And always the hours, the hours price always is higher than the materials cost. That roll of filament, you'll be surprised how long it'll go. And you just think it's still going. And then the best part, if you're really, really good at it, you have the ability, um, you have, if you put a sensor on it, you actually have the ability to find out how much filament you're, you're using and how much you have left. And if the current project that you have right now will tell you if you have enough filament based on what the, is read by this little chip on it. But filament, essentially, there's, there's, essentially, there's three main ones that right now we're working with. Right now, you have PLA, which is polyethylene. Uh, plastic. It's the base. It's the best, in my opinion, is what we work with. It's one of the best robust types of, of filament that we have out there. Then after you have ABS. Um, ABS is acidic base. It has like uh, acid in the center of it. Um, and one of the things about ABS, it's really strong. The only problem is, is that it's a bit toxic. Um, so it's recommended to have it ventilated. On top of that, it's heat sensitive. So if the if 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 the if there's like if you have an air conditioner blowing on top of your printer, it'll actually cause the ABS to bend and pop yeah. off, right? And then the final one, which is really pop, which is another popular one, it's PETG. It's basically a much stronger version of PLA. The only issue with it is that it requires machines that have the ability to operate at higher temperatures. One of the things about operating an, uh, a, a 3D printing is that it has a lot of current running through it. You know, you have to understand that the uh, hot end, which is where the filament comes out of, is usually operating at 200, 100 degrees Celsius. So you're looking at 500, 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And also the bed, if your bed is heated, oh, another recommendation, make sure that your bed is heated because parts like to stick onto a heated bed better. If your bed is heated, normally you're operating between 50 degrees Celsius and 60. So it's still very hot to the touch, has the ability to burn you. So remember, that's the other thing about it is safety is another thing. Do not operate... Hmm, I say this, but do not operate a 3D printer without supervision or some sort of supervision. So what we have is we have 3D cameras that are actually on the printer, right? And what it does is that it's actually measuring two things, the heat of the bed and of the, of the area that it's there. And then the other thing that it has is that it has a, it's looking at the model and making sure it's not sliding. So that means that it's detached from the plate. And what that does is if any of those are out of place, the first thing it does is that it cuts the power to the printer. If there's a fire that started, two things will happen. It'll drench. It'll drench the, it'll drench the printer in water to prevent it from damaging. I actually literally have water units on the top of it. Or it'll cut the printer off to prevent the overheating from going. Some printers now also have the ability to cut off when their heat sensors are out of sense. And that's cool. Yeah, uh, one, of your, one of your people just said that they've printed out a guitar body 
uh, with that. Now that's a feat because that's a lot of printing. <laughs> but yeah, I would have never thought it. You, I mean, that's a big bet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I didn't know what's that technical. I mean, I know it's technical, but I didn't think about the heat and stuff like that. It's like when we are doing mocks, we have to make sure that room temperature is always the same. Otherwise, our ovens are going to take longer or shorter, and the quality of the print is not going to be the same as it was done during testing when you know when we have a consistent environment. Uh, and it makes sense. At the end of the day, it makes sense, right? You have to every time you have you build something, you want to now make sure that your that you have your processes and that always are being met so that you get the, con- the constant quality of what you're producing. Otherwise, you know, things start getting different. Uh, and when something is dependent on heat and you don't have the same heat, you end up getting different shades of the color as well because of the way that it cools and because of the way it cooks. It's, I don't know if that affects in, you know, in, in filament, but I know it does in print on demand, you know, when it comes to ink. Uh, the way we heat it is how bright and how pale it will get. Uh, if we don't do it right. Um, so how many of you say you have of those now? I mean, last time, last time I went to your warehouse was in the warehouse of your office or whatever. Oh, little, did you remember the little one or did you go to the new one? I the went one. to the one we were crowded. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gone to the new one. You haven't, you, you, you haven't accepted guests yet. Well, guess guess what? The the new one that we went in was uh twelve uh was twelve feet was uh sixty it's sixteen feet by twelve feet and we're already crammed into that one as well. We're actually having to look for another facility or we're gonna bust a hole next to the next one next to us and make our facility a little bit bigger um, because we are again sardined with all of the big my stuff's getting bigger um, as of right now. Yeah, we have nine. We've stuck with nine because. Um, I do have to admit something also really quick that the printing market is kind of a bit gluttoned right now. The most important thing when it comes to 3D printing is are you able to create something? And that's the second half aspect of many aspects of this of this particular industry. But you need to be able to create something because someone could go on to Thingiverse, but then they want to make this modification to a thing or they want to personalize it that's where we specialize in so for uh for example uh right now i'm working on a trophy for a game called flesh and blood someone had achieved it and um they gave me the parameters and they actually let me go wild and i'm like can i do it this way and i'm in the process of producing a trophy um we've actually like we're, right now, one of the things that's really been popular is trophies. Someone will get a model and they say, can you make this bigger for me? And then can you put it on something? And adding that uniqueness really kind of makes you stand out. And that's an important thing. I'm not saying you can do um, like don't go to Blender, which is like a really advanced program. But for example, we use Tinkercad and Tinkercad is what we use to kind of modify some stuff. Now, um, there are some basic things that you can do in Tinkercad. But with my other aspects of the business, we actually do uh, also stereolithography lines, which is called an SVG, which we have the ability to make objects, extrude and make an object out of that. So the important thing is, again, the, and I say it and I say it here, creating something is the most important thing ever. Then after that comes process. And here is another f- another point where a lot of people feel like I can't keep up. Having a website or a form, which what I have is you go on, you you kind of get the rules, and then a person will give me a file, and then I go and I look at it. Now, here's actually the interesting thing. I don't actually look at it. I have a robot on Google that grabs that file, brings that file into a drive. That drive is constantly scanned by a robot, a bot, essentially, and it gets the file and it prepares it for me. It'll crunch all of the numbers. It'll get everything ready. It'll pull in all of my settings and it'll tell me at the end of the day, Julio, this is going to cost this and this is how much time it is. Then after that, I have to go in and I have to make sure. And another very important thing, copyright. Is this a product that has been made by somebody that this person either wants to keep for himself for personal use or is trying to resell it? 
very important to make sure that stuff is not copyrighted. Now, some people with like Thingiverse, there are some that say you can do it for commercial use. So what my program does is that it goes out and if a person has supplied a link, it'll actually go and grab the link, scan it and make sure that it is for commercial use. And then I would tell the person that it's not for commercial use. You'd have to get permission from the person to go and, and do that. And that's the thing. When it's on Thingiverse, usually they have a service that's tied to it and already built in that does the same thing. So some people would come in and would request something and I would have to deny them because I've said, sorry, it's copyrighted. Or someone would say, yeah, you can actually print it out freely as long as you give creditation to the person. So I would tell the person, you know, give the person the credit that the person had built it, whether it's in person or whether you're showing it off on Facebook. Yeah, because I have seen plenty of websites where you can go and literally just grab uh, 3D, you know, uh, plans or whatever you call them. But some of them are very trademark infringing, you know. I mean, it's like uh, Star Wars spaceship models and, and things like that. And you're like, I don't think you can do something like that, you know, for uh, even if it's for personal use. I, I, I don't know. Um, well, I mean, you are building yourself and for your house. I mean, who can tell you anything, right? But <laughs> if you use a third-party company, it's what you enter into the okay, the green, the, the the gray lines. Is the can I or can I not do something with this, uh, with with this model that they're asking me? What have you? I mean, just to give us an idea, like what you can print, what do you got there that we can see? I have quite a, I have quite a, well, not quite a bit of things. i but I have like, for example. And, and of course, talking about what you're talking about, that is Creative Commons. Now, the thing is, is that someone, a Creative Commons is a very gray, gray, gray area, right? Um, you know, for example, uh, I have this little baby Yoda that's right here. Now, someone, now, someone rendered this in 3D in his own vision. And so because of that, it's just a little, you know, because of that, he created it and that falls under common, right? So he built it himself and he can build, he can build it and you can put it on the website and other people can print it for personal use. And so in this particular case, right, another cool one, this was, this is actually, I don't know if you guys are a big fan of the last starfighter, but uh, this is actually, I need to give this back to, I need to give this to the person who requested it like a month ago. We did 30 days of prints. This is the starfighter. So you can go and do some, complex items you can like look at that like, the one with dennis quaid that the other is, quaid? is that movie with dennis quaid are you, dennis quaid is that the are you talking about total recall no this is not the starfighter that is not with dennis is the guy's name dennis quaid i keep on thinking of quaid because that's the quaid from uh total recall i just finished yeah, watching it recently is, uh, is, is that the one with the alien the male alien has a baby no I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> now you're gonna make me Google. Okay, go it's a teeny movie. You have to go watch. It's good on. Di it's a Disney Plus. Now this one's interesting because this is actually 3D printed. Very complex model. But what has happened is this is this comes under the other thing. This is going to extra mile for your customer, which is called post processing. Now this model uh, would have a bunch of lines on it. But what we did is we've sprayed some plastic, uh, some plastic rub on it. Um, oh, that's right. I, <laughs> I had a giveaway. I put the wrong date on. Um, uh, right now, like this model has been post-processed. So I sprayed a couple of times and I got the lines out. But you can see how the complexity is. And there's supposed to be a sword that comes out of here. So that's uh, one of you. And then the other thing, and I'm going to give you guys another warning, is that once your friends find out that you have a 3D printer, they are going to ask you to build them a bunch of stuff, family members and everyone. Even my wife asked me, can you build me a bracket? Can you build me this? Can you build me that? So be prepared for that. That I didn't notice until later. Everyone wants you to 3D print something for them. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't asked for a bunch of junk, but yeah, it gets, I mean, it's only the beginning. Then they forget about it and they move on. Uh, so okay, three printing. It's now those rooms. Th th I mean, it's a lot of heat. Th th those rooms get warm, or I mean, yes, especially like I have. You know, we have the laser printer, which is you know has literally four rotating suns located in the center compartment of it. I have, and at, once we have everyone going full bore, um, we notice a good uptick 
we have to actually request for the air conditioner to be put at 70 at 70 and keep it at 70 because we'll take up to 75 and then oh humidity keep that humidity at 50 or lower any higher you get problems because the one thing that filament loves is moisture oh it loves moisture and that is one of the things when it rains here in houston i look at the i look at the barometer and i see oh man i'm already at 80 percent so normally one of the procedures that we do is if we know we're not going to use the printers for a while we actually have a hermetically sealed container with you know the little um moisture rocks that kind of wick moisture out we actually have them that we have the ability to reset them you put them in the oven for about uh, an hour and a half just on low heat resets them they're able to accept moisture and then you put it back in but we put them in a hermetically sealed container to keep filament dry because especially abs hates moisture um and and the biggest offender is going to be nylon nylon you just looking at it it already has moisture inside of it and i'm going to recommend something nylon is not if if you're going to go in and the first thing you're going to tell yourself is i'm going to 3d print with nylon you're already setting up to fail that is a very difficult material to work with it requires not just high heat but it also requires that printer to be in a very very humidity controlled and i mean we're talking 20s in houston forget yeah. about it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're, we're in the swamp, of the swamp area where yeah. humidity is everywhere. Uh, thank you, Cordelia. Yes, enemy mine. That is the one I was thinking. I, I don't know why I always confuse it. Uh, <laughs> I love that movie though. Uh, I don't know why I like it. I just like it. Uh, she's asking, do you have a commercial printer? I, I think you already answered that question, but I, I don't know if the one you were talking about is a commercial. Is just a more you know like the ender is that a commercial printer or what is no, it no it's absolutely not it's actually a, a a commercial printer will run you between ten thousand to twenty thousand dollars and and what makes them so special is that um they have higher bearing parts uh, on top of that they'll switch heads they'll have two heads um, they'll be able to accept various type of filaments so yes my come no i don't have any commercial ones i actually have home use printers which a lot of companies they have like the king of and the father of printer which is prusa he has over 1100 of his prusa threes which are just home built printers that are just in a warehouse that are used to print other prusa parts that's all they do and then when they're done they kind of like retire them and they give them to people or they donate them to schools so they can use them they still have life in them and they still can get the job done and yeah so a commercial definitely don't need to fall into that trap you can definitely get a printing business started with just one simple ender three and just going one step at a time on it there you go and those ones, you said they were like anywhere from 150 to 250 each and something like that, is what you said? Yeah, right now I can get an Ender, I can get my DYI Ender 3 for around $178. And if you get it on some days where it's free shipping and tax free, that's even better. I don't want one, but I use. <laughs> I, I, mean, I know that if I get one, I am, you know, and I, I am going to end up buying more. And because, you know, Patience is not my virtue, and if I want to start printing something before I realize, I'm like, yeah, 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 I need to another one to print the something else before I realize I'm gonna have four or five, and I don't want to do that. It's I don't want to have machinery right now because I don't have space. I so no, <laughs> but I have friends to do that, and right. I can hire them to do something that for me. So and and that works. That works. That works great. So. 3 printing, we already, I mean, anybody has any question of 3D printer? Because I would like to go now into UV and something else. Um, since we are already, you know, talking different types of printing and owning your own, you know, printing machines and how to, you know, how scalable it is to have a business like that for, you know, to do, to start a business. Uh, yeah, he brought on curiosity and he got three now. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and one important thing about 3D printers is that when when it comes to making money the more you have it, it scales um it scales parallel the more you have the more per hour you're able to make because they're all doing work at one time 
Uh, on top of that, here's the thing. 3D printers are doing the job. You, the human, are doing nothing. So you can either be creating your next job, processing your next job, or like me, I am 3D printing on the side while I'm UV printing. And of course, also UV printer jobs take a while as well. And then I have the more physical one, which is the card printing. So having those three, I realized that my hour, my capital per hour starts to increase the more machines I have active at one time. And the most important thing is you are the machine. The way you do it, the way you design it. And, and that's the other thing. So the machines, you can either hook on it directly one-to-one -one or do it like me. All my machines are networked. So they're hooked up to one computer and the one computers get the job and then they assign the jobs out to people. So again, it's, and it, it was never like that. I first had to get the job, put it in my old in my computer, get it ready to go and put it in there. Now I have a shared drive that grabs all the jobs and puts it and parses it and processes it. So you're going to start off slow, but eventually you, you'll go, oh, how do I make this better? And there's so much research out in the internet to help you out. Go to Google. It's definitely, I mean, obviously Google it, but uh, definitely head over to, um, you know, Thingiverse. Uh, I, rec I recommend that. Also, there's a place called Hackaday. They do really good articles about improving printers because right now what we're trying to do in 3D printing is one of two things. We're either trying to make it faster or we're trying to push more filament uh, through the unit. So somebody's asking, like, do you, how do you lend to software? Or are you self-taught? Are you, well, how do you do it? I was self-taught. It's all about, it's all about patience. And there was a lot of like, a lot of crying. <laughs> um, but it, I was definitely self-taught. It was all learned because you just, the, you learn on your own. You can go and you can really build anything. That's the most important thing, right? So the software, there's two really popular soft. Uh, first, oh, here's the thing. 3D printers are, I don't know if you know the process of printing, but printing is essentially a coordinate from X to Y, but the 3D printer adds a Z and uh, the filament. So basically the way it works is the printer just gets numbers and it calculates just like a regular normal printer there. You think you're printing a letter A, but you're not. You're actually printing a code that's related to one of the printers that you have. Like Epson codes, you actually have the ability to feed code directly to an Epson printer to make it do something, especially the dot matrix. So what you do is you first get the STL, which is a stereo lithography file, which is gonna look like you know your 3D model. It's gonna look like this. It, this is what the computer sees, but now we need to put it into a language that a 3D printer sees. So what you do is you get this STL file and you put it into something called a slicer. And the reason why it's called a slicer is because a 3D print is actually a combination of a bunch of layers. For example, this guy is 995 layers. So eventually all these layers combined together make something. And when it talks about slicing, it's slice a layer and you build a layer. Now, when you actually cut this model and you look at it, you're going to see like a hollow end of it. You're just going to see a hollow piece with an outer wall. And what that slicer does is that it converts it into a binary file or a G code. Now, the G code is just a long sheet of numbers and coordinates that gets fed into the printer. The printer gets the portion of the G-code. It says, I'm going to go from here. I'm going to spew out this much filament, and I'm going to go here. I'm going to spew out this much filament. And every single time it's doing that, the computer is telling it, you go do something. And then the printer says, I acknowledge that I just finished doing this. Please send me my next, next instruction. And that is a G-code. And that is actually from beginning to end how you would go about processing a STL file and how the printer is going to read it. And there is software to do that, right? You don't have to. You don't have to do the coding yourself. That is correct. The slicers mm -hmm. of popular slicers. Prusa has a new slicer. Um, we are a Cura. We are a Cura. That is C U R A. We are a Cura house. Um, we start off with that one. Uh, there are also places where you can build your STL files, such as Simplify 3D by AutoCAD. That's another good one. That's right there. And then the G code. Every printer in the world. It's a standard. Every printer knows about it. Yeah. So uh, Eric is asking, are you, you, do you, are you using something like an octoprint to control the printers? I have no idea what that is. Uh, yes. Uh, octoprint is actually, think of an octopus, 
uh, it has many hands, and then you have the center, right? That's the computer. The hands is what dulls out the jobs for the printers. And in this particular case, we use um, we don't use Octoprint. Octoprint's a really good one, and they work on Linux-based machines. You can actually hook it up to uh, to there. But we actually have our own in-house uh, 3D print uh, 3D printing server. Um, I, it just it eludes me right now. Uh, once I remember it, I will let you know. But we paid like $98 for it, and it allows for us to also view 3D projects in real time. The most important thing, it has a, a Cura API connections. So I have the ability to just directly interface with my STL, and it does all the processing for me. OK. So let's move a little bit into all the topics. That, this box, you made it. This box. I'm, we, you made it. I made it. I didn't make it. A team you, made it. Yes, yeah, but, yeah, but it, it was done in your facility. It wasn't, yes. it wasn't asked some other company to make it. It wasn't ordered from China. You wanted something that would fit this number of cards with this number of dice. You measured it. You came up with the idea that it fits in here, and it was made. What is done to do this? This is the advantage of using the SVG, also known as vector art. And that requires a program called Inkscape or Adobe Illustrator. And uh, by a team, I want to make sure that I give credit to my team. Um, uh, again, Mark Evans, uh, Richard, uh, Joshua Schott were the card creators. Um, but what you see here is the art. Thank you, Parker Simpson artwork. They hooked me up with this. But the box design was done by Aegis. We combined it all together. We actually grabbed the logos. And more importantly, we created uh, the cut file. And so the process is we get the S we get the SVG file and we create the lines. And actually I have a video on that. We stream every we stream every Sunday. If you want to see some cool stuff, head over to the uh, Twitch TV, Aegis underscore broadcasting. I do something really cool every Sunday. Uh, we just built a really cool trophy. So you want to check out the 3D printing, you want to know about it, ask me questions on how to build something yeah. that's actually a good place to go actually the title of the in the description of this live guys there is a link for her for his facebook page and there's a link for his store where you can see what he can make and stuff like that uh he is he lives you live in spring or you live in houston i live in willowbrook i'm on, on northwest I, I'm know, just on north I don't want to say spring texas because i'm not sure you're in the borderline you're no, still in houston right yeah we're still houston yeah we're, we're right houston. at the border yeah okay. so we can houston. shoot fireworks <laughs> Yeah, so it's like because you're like literally living the borderline of spring in Houston. So I live in spring and he's in Houston. Uh, right, so Fernando. you're very human here. Probably as I don't know, is is I think you're in Atlanta, right, Cordelia? So you probably have the same uh, weather conditions that we do. Uh, I don't know. It's a, bit, a little bit drier. Uh, yeah. It'll be like, but not much. Especially if you're in like the more mountainous regions, um, probably north of Atlanta. Kind of heading close to Tennessee, uh, like somewhere up there, up north, where you're starting to get into the mountains. And actually, Fernando, going back, see this box? Yeah. So what had happened was we were playing magic. They were playing magic. <laughs> and sometimes you just need to copy someone who's doing it better than you or who has it. The only problem was, and so what I did was I went to my buddy Jonathan, Jonathan Lowe. I'm like, hey, Jonathan, do you want this box? Can I take it? I remember when you asked him that. <laughs> That's <laughs> I you're watching watching the that. inception. This is the inception right here. And so what we did was we got this and I shoved it into a scanner. And then I started to trace out the line on it. Now, one of the issues that we did have, and you'll notice with the with the with the charitable forces, is that it's a little bit bigger because I actually measured how much cards how much cards were and then how many dice fit on the on the in, in there so i made it just a little bit bigger so i had to extend it out oh oh one more thing about 3d printing the metric system is going to be your new best friend whether you like it or not we do not operate in inches we operate in metric so millimeters will be your new best friend <laughs> so, and buy a caliper <laughs> I know meeting meters, so I'm fine with that. <laughs> I know how to convert it. I know what an inch looks like. Uh, sometimes I have to convert it when I'm working with bigger stuff. Um, but yeah, essentially that's what we did. And then you know, um, and then after that, kind of like, oh, the art goes here. So we we did that, and I did some of the design inside of Inkscape. And then once we had it, the computer has it flat like this. Then we f uh, we create something called a bleed. 
right? And the bleed yeah. extends out so you can cut the box without showing off the white stuff. So what we did was we fed this particular design into a program called Dragon Cut, which came with our Dragon Cutter. Uh, and I put it in. It actually scanned the image, and then we were able to create the bleed um, with the file with there. Now, this particular one, I wanted it I wanted a specific bleed, so I actually created the line because, believe it or not, the Dragon Cutter, which is the Vi – sorry, the Vi Cutter is what we call it, and Vivian is her name. She uh, cuts – using SVG, which is the same technology that we use for our 3D printing. And they essentially work together, except they only, the cutter only operates in a Z and X axis. I'm sorry, X and Y axis, not a Z axis. Flat, it's like a cricket. Yeah, like, like a cricket. And mm, glad you mentioned that. Don't buy it. I have Don't a, buy I the mean, cricket. I, I never use it. <laughs> it, is a, it is a great um, machine. For nothing. For terrible idea. The software is junk and that's yeah. i was about to mm, mm. yeah i wanted to use it for my dice and it didn't work yep it didn't work <laughs> it's so much hate i hate that thing it's when i got the dragon cutter the software was 80 bucks okay and no joke i'm gonna tell you right now that dragon cutter was um i got it for 1500 plus uh importing so it was another 600 on top of that i'm sorry it was 2300 plus another 600 for importing and then another 290 for you know getting it off the boat and putting it in a warehouse. And then I had to actually drive my van to go and pick it up. It is the best three thousand dollars I've ever spent, and I do not regret it. It was the best thing ever, and that's what took my business from we were only doing like a couple of cards to doing like we can do we can do roughly oh my lord, how many cards? We can do roughly about 350 cards an hour. Oh, it does not say you know that. And just and I mean I don't even have a and I and I haven't even started with the offset printing either. That's I'm not ready to go into that, but eventually I'm hoping not to get to there. But once you get to offset printing, that's a whole different animal. But the best thing to do is was the digital was a digital printing, and that's Octavia also made this happen. Um, we were only working with eight by elevens, and then we realized once we had some downtime, we like to do something called R and D. Research and development, always do it to improve a process. And now that's how come we're able to do, like before we were only averaging about maybe 90 cards a month, an hour. Now we're doing them much better, much faster, higher quality, like almost card quality product. It's like so good. Yeah, I mean, your, your card printing quality has increased uh, drastically. So, which takes me now to the UV printer. Uh, UV printer and print on demand is pretty new uh, in terms of you know like making things like this right is a mm -hmm. uh, which honestly make things look nice. Uh, for some reason, not many print on demand facilities offer it, other than very limited. To be honest, I think Custom CAD and other ones that I to do, you have one of those. Uh, how oh, yeah. how does that operate? How, I mean, those are not cheap. That is, that is probably. I mean, I don't know what you, which one you have, but thousand eight hundred, thousand eight hundred. We got, um, we actually got a no name, uh, printer. Uh, it was the first one we ever got. Um, and again, it was a test, right? That just like three D printing, we kind of eased ourselves into it. We tried not to lose any money. Um, and I was worried that that was the case. It was a really big investment at the time. Uh, now uh, I don't regret it. Here's the thing about Bertha, and here's the thing about UV printing. <laughs> Maintenance is very, very high. And sometimes some people prefer to just cut it out on a stencil and then heat it onto the product and call it a day or print it out. Like sometimes I wish that I can do what I – I wish sometimes Octavia can do what Bertha can do. But what Bertha, our particular machine specializes in is actually clear – custom cards um we have the ability to print on metal um that's that metal is awesome everyone loves it but actually as of late um clear stock my clear stock my clear pvc cards which i am sorry i don't have any um here yeah i don't have either one oh no i don't have any of it but i do have like you know like this is this is called um this is called project glass the uv printer has the ability to print on glass and so if i take off 
if I take it off, you could put any background that you want. So this is the background. This is the piece, and it's actually printed on, on a piece of glass, just like that. You can see the reflection and everything. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about UV printer. This is called Project Glass. Essentially, you just I would have the models here, but this was a I keep all the rejects. <laughs> I keep all the ugly ones because you know they were the first one that we tried it out. And then eventually, um, that's the advantage that we have the ability to print on it. Now, here's the thing about UV printing. Um, maintenance. The uh, the heads are extremely. Um, what you're doing is a UV printer is essentially a modified inkjet printer. So, for example, we have an Epson L800, which is a 16 year old printer technology. It's in this thing. That is, and the head is also that old as well. Um, you know, Epson doesn't make it anymore. They have these newer, fancier ones. And what China did was they converted it and put reservoirs inside of them that allows them to push UV ink through it. Now. The problem with UV ink is that it causes the print heads to jam up. And that's the biggest thing that a person has to fight. So because of that, the machine needs to be ran practically daily. So if I have to go on vacation, I have to have someone go to the facility, i.e. my wife or my brother or a friend, to come over to the facility. They need to go turn on Bertha, and they need to do a couple of head cleans to make sure she doesn't clog up overnight. Because just having a couple of heads clog up really diminishes quality off the machine and, yeah, and that's, that's pretty much uh, pretty much any high efficiency printer you have to you have to make sure like i had a edible ink printer that if i didn't clean it every day it, it would just be messy um one of the things about getting into this business is that you have to be hands-on it's not one of those that you like oh you, i just want to have a premium business and i just going to let it run uh Unless you have employees that know what they're doing, and you know, but you're gonna start this in, in your garage, you gotta be ready to learn how to do maintenance uh, because you're not gonna be calling uh, maintenance to come and fix it for you because that is gonna eat all your profits right away, right? So you gotta learn how to do the maintenance. You're gonna learn how to do you know procedures to how to keep them keep them running. And and the thing about these machines is that you have to keep them working as much as possible because the money is on what they're working. Uh, if you have them, you stare, you know, they don't make you absolutely nothing. So it's about, even if it's, even if it's a business, a, a, you know, a job to break you even, it's gonna make you more money breaking even than not making you money at all because it keeps the machine working, which saves you in maintenance, which saves you, you know, and cleaning it and stuff like that. So it makes sense to do something like that. Uh, I'm gonna talk in my monster. Good night. Good night, Uh but yes, it's 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 it's, it's interesting. Um, I I used to have a, a wholesale produce facility uh, where we used to uh, drop the limes as they were, you know. I mean, probably it's gonna freak some people out to learn this, but. Um, <laughs> uh, key limes when they arrive they are not as green as you see them in these plastic bags uh you see those little bags that you see now in the stores with the limes inside actually my family is the one that came out with that for heb we actually came out with that process uh, we will receive those limes and uh, we will put them through a system that it will wash them and then it will be a process of green edible ink with wax that would actually cover them and make them look green as shiny and then they will go to a dry process and then they will go to uh, an airing process and then they will go into the what you know, the the little coming that it will make them shine and then they will come and then we will select the ones that were ugly and then they will go into bags it's a process to make something look nice and pretty that will then we'll go into the little two pound bags and that's what you buy you know on HEB or whatever your store you have right now in you know in your, in your state it's process and if you don't know how to fix the machines and if you don't know how to repair them you know you want to have to have somebody there 24 7 fixing them and they don't charge cheap because you know cost of maintenance is high so uh it's something that it's it, it, it you have to consider that right uh when you have a 3d machine you, you you're gonna take some time for you to balance it make sure that everything is flowing to make the temperature control 
some people like to have external garages and then they like to have the machines there that right there i can tell you that is not going to work very well uh because you know i in it because you don't have a control temperature in those in those ones because they don't they don't they don't have insulation they have nothing temperature is going to be up high and low the whole day as you know the day is high and the night's low you are never going to have consistent quality so you you need to start thinking about all those things when you want to do something like this mm -hmm. what is the number one reason you think you would have failed if you hadn't done it As a friend of mine said, walls in front, rubble behind. That is, it is keep on pushing forward, never stopping. Because the moment that you stop, and and we've had, uh, you know, there was, I mean, there was at one time Bertha was ripped up, all opened up because we had the belt snap. And it required, that's the one thing about the this china printer i am the maintenance guy i have taken the printer apart hour after hour i know like its intricacies and i've ran into almost all the problems now that if i got this printer again i know what i would do um, i wouldn't necessarily get this printer again because you could see that china did hack it up pretty good to make it a machine trust me fernando you come over you see it you go what is this you're gonna <laughs> what <laughs> um but it's you're going to have to go at it yourself. Sometimes you're going to be alone and you need to go and you got to dig deep to, to, to get, to get the job done. And as a CEO and also as a master fabricate, we master fabricator, we fabricate, you gotta dig deep. Sometimes, sometimes you got to get away from it and just kind of let it burn for a little bit. And then after that, come back at it and fix it. And that's how you will not fail. If you have that mindset that failure is not an option and you want to keep on pushing it forward, I promise you, if you do that, no matter how hard or the obstacles you, it's all about the journey, you'll be stronger and you will not fail. Awesome. Any last question, anybody? We have a bunch of people watching in YouTube and in you know, Facebook. I mean, there have been some questions. So uh, anyone Wars. watching? Wars. Star Wars. I know. <laughs> I need to do my deck for tomorrow. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, tomorrow is tomorrow. Tomorrow is Wednesday. My Star Wars late night, but today is May the fourth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have probably need me to see with a shirt, and today I actually have a shirt. Yeah, okay. got my <laughs> got my drinking shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I is the rare when I wear shirts. Uh, but anyways, if there are no more questions, uh, Julio, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Uh, the links for you know for what they can learn about you, they can watch your live show, and when they can you know learn more about ages are in the in the in the description of this video. You can go visit there anytime. Uh, last words you want to say uh, before we wrap it up, uh, Fernando. This has been an absolute treat, and if you want me to come on again man let's this was fun i cannot believe how much fun this has actually been i no, want to thank you for <laughs> <laughs> I, I want for you to thank me i want to thank you for joining for like letting me join in your adventure here i never thought that you would just kind of ask me to kind of do this and i mean this was totally uh totally awesome a uh, couple of things guys if you are in houston Comic Palooza is happening this year again uh, we have booth number 1525 Go ahead. If you want to come and say hi, come check me out in Houston. We're crossing our fingers. We got our application for Gen Con, which is one of the biggest board game conventions that's out there. We're going to be there as well. My brother is actually building his own board game. And we're, and you know, since we're a 3D, since we can build anything, we can build <laughs> a board game. So we're going to be doing that as well. Very excited about that. And the most important thing, ladies and gentlemen, as the master fabricator of the Aegis Creative Company, I always tell you to go out there and be creative. Even though it's not Sunday, but we are getting into hump day, you still have enough time to create something for not just yourself or for a loved one. So I ask you to follow our motto. Go out there, be creative, and build something. Check us out, uh, www.aegisccc.com. Check us out on Facebook. That, that's at the Aegis Creative Co., Go ahead and hit there. Check us out on Twitch at Aegis underscore broadcasting every Sunday at 730, guys. Thank you very much.
yeah, every Sunday he does a different project. You can see how he does it. It's it's fun to watch. If you're into that that type of stuff. Uh, you should check him out. And thank you so much, Julio. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful night. And remember, uh, tomorrow is the PLD Labs. Is the first session is tomorrow. Uh, you know, we start tomorrow at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. So you haven't gotten, you know, uh, re registered. We still have space. Uh, the first topic tomorrow is going to be printables. And then we're going to have the topic of G G uh, lead magnets. And then we're going to have the topic of how to do Facebook groups to drive your audience. Thank you so much, everyone. And have a wonderful night. Peace. Dungu.